Jack Brennan, you were uh, President Nixon's uh, Marine aide, military aide, and then you uh, worked as his chief of staff in San Clemente and continued to uh, be a uh, friend and confidant and an advisor to him for the rest of his life. You were on each of his three trips to China in 72, 76, and 79. Uh, what to, we'll begin, let's begin at the beginning. What, what are your main memories? I mean, I'm sure you could talk for hours about each one, but uh, what are some highlights of that first amazing uh, trip, the, the week that changed the world, uh, Nixon in China in 72? Uh, a guy named Vern Corfe, the Army aide to the president, was on the advance trip, so he was stationed on the ground when we came into Beijing. And I accompanied the president. I was on Air Force One for, for the trip to China. Uh, of course, it was a, a, a remarkable trip in its totality, but <clears throat> just to be a part of it and to, and to know how important the first handshake was going to be with uh, Joe and Lai, and I was right behind them and I was pretty excited about that. <clears throat> they asked me to not be in uniform, but as you know, the Marines were the last ones thrown out of China in 1948, and I was a bit defiant. Who was the they who asked you? The uh, Chinese or the Chinese, State Department? Or Chinese, both? Yeah. Chinese via the State Department. Right. Uh, so I came in uniform anyway. And uh, the next day, there was a great snowstorm the first night. The second, the first morning, <clears throat> when we were staying, there were almost hotels were non-existent. The National Hotel where the advance team was had a fire. So we were in government guest quarters behind a wall. And I went out for a walk early in the morning. And I went outside the wall and to see how pretty this snowfall was and how they were dealing with it. And the way they were dealing with it was score, no, hundreds of Chinese with brooms. That was the snow plows. And that was the beginning of the trip. It was all very exciting, the great things that we saw. <clears throat> um, I remember um, in Shanghai, minutes before the Shanghai Communications was released, or was signed, uh, Dr. Kissinger in his inimitable fashion, all up to his entire staff, he's ranting at all of them. And I don't know what they were changing at the last second, but they were changing something. And it was, uh, it was all very, very interesting. Um, the second trip was 1976, post-presidency. Um, I made the arrangements for President and Mrs. Nixon to go to China at the invitation of the Chinese. John, I mean, um, <coughs> Chairman Mao was still alive at that time, near the end of his, uh, near the end of his tenure. And uh, President Nixon said, uh, now in these arrangements, you're sure we're going to see Chairman Mao. And I said, no, sir, I'm not, because the way that... In any, my experience with dealing with the communist countries is the only ones who make a decision are the ones on top. And you can present anything you want to all day with the people you're negotiating with. And they usually, in China, they would say, have a tangerine, that was your answer. And in Russia, they'd say, have a drink, that was your answer, until they went back to the powers to be, and then they would uh, say yes or no. So I did not know, and we were in China, and I did not know, and he was getting a bit antsy. And finally, late one night, the foreign minister, with whom I had by then established a rapport, came into my room and uh, said, Jim and Mao want to, see, uh, want to see President and Mrs. Nixon. I said, OK, great, I'll get him. And put on my uniform. He said, oh, and Jim and Mao want, to see, want you to come. Well, President Nixon wanted to just be alone. <laughs> and uh, I said, no, no, no. He said, oh, yes. The thing Chinese admire the most is loyalty. And when the president came in 1972, there were hundreds of Americans, and now there's just you. And he wants to thank you. Uh, by then, I had, presumptuously or not, someone had taught me how to say what an honor to meet you in his dialect, in Chairman Mao's dialect. So um, we told President Nixon, said, Mrs. Nixon and I are by name invited to go along. He's all right, well, you'll just come in the room and uh, shake hands and leave, you know, <laughs> as if you were going to have substantive discussion. The important thing to me then, we went into the room, and the interpreter, who was Nancy Kwan, I think her last name is, Nancy. The Nancy Tang. Tang, yeah, okay. Uh, Chairman Mao uh, uttered something in a guttural that no one could understand, and she very eloquently said, Chairman Mao says. <laughs> and, so then I, when we shook hands, I gave my spiel about <clears throat> how great it was to, to, meet this, uh, to meet him in his dialect, and he just get, laughed a little bit. And there were other conversations. I promise you, this man must have had you know, strokes or whatever. He, you could not understand him. It was just mumbling. <clears throat> but she came up with the party line and said, Chairman Ma says so. <clears throat> so finally, Mrs. Nixon and I left 
uh, Bill Sapphire was then with the Washington, uh, with the New York Times, and he kept nagging me to write everything down, write everything down. And I said, why, Bill, why? You know, but because it's history. I know. <laughs> well, I did it. On this part of the trip, I did it. And I, and I still have the notes where, when we left the, uh, his little, and it was just a little cubicle where uh, Chairman Ma lived, or where he had his met people anyway. And I wrote down everything, and she squeezed my hand. She and I had to leave. The president's there alone for these high-level conversations with a guy who couldn't even speak, you know, anything. Was it, was it the same uh, room as the first time yes. with the books lining up? The, the books lining up, and they had the lights, you know, the camera places, everything ready. And, of course, I, you know, we got still photos anyway. And what, what was he, what did he look like? Was he tall? I assume they had to stand him up. They had to help <laughs> him stand up, like, as in 72. Right. But what was, what was the physical presence of him um, like? You know, no, uh, not as heavy as the photos you see and not as heavy as the, the uh, publicity photos that we use for years and years. And, uh, but otherwise, you know, he looked, he's certainly recognizable. Uh, and dis despite the strokes and the, and the fact that he was old by then, older even, uh, did you have the feeling that he was taking in what was happening or that he was propped up by people who no, as, as a problem? No, uh, no he, uh, he understood certainly what was going on, if you're implying that, and he was just, uh, you know, fulfilling his responsibility as what we would call a, a head of government. Uh, excuse me, a chief of state, not a head of government. He was a chief of state and he <clears throat> was fulfilling that duty and doing the handshakes, but nothing more substantive than that, I'm sure, I'm sure. Yeah. What are the, the, the differences, which, again, how many hours do we have, uh, of going as the military aid, which had its own uh, heavy responsibilities mm -hmm. in 72, um, and then going back four years later as the chief of staff? I mean, that must have been a, an incredible, mm -hmm. uh, uh, substantively, logistically, in every way. Was it in November of 76, or when was it in 76? Uh, I can't remember. In the fall Frank. of 76. It was, just it was a fall, but I don't remember if it was November. No, no, it was in February because it was for the for the anniversary of well, the of, course, uh, of, course, of the trip. Of yeah. course, yeah. I was trying to think. I know it was cold again, <laughs> but but the seventy six. Well, it was it was uh, you know I had a lot more responsibility and more, a lot more direct uh, dealings, and I became uh, by then Joe and Lai had died, and um, the foreign minister became my counterpart so to speak, and very very helpful, and he could speak he spoke English very well. And the guy who was the chief of protocol in 1972 was later became the ambassador to the United States, um, Han Shu. Han Shu. And Han Shu, of course, met with me and he spoke perfect English and he arranged some things that he knew we would like. He was very helpful. But the foreign minister is the one who came and, and was helpful in this regard. He's the one, as I say, who came and said, we're going to go see him. Then President Nixon was. Um, we were going to be hosted one evening by the wife of Chairman Mao, who is the Minister of Culture, and her name, I think, is Cheng Cheng. Cheng Cheng, Cheng yes. Cheng Cheng. And um, he warned me, the foreign minister did, <coughs> that um, one of the songs, he said, the fifth song that you hear is going to be a tirade denouncing Taiwan and saying how we Chinese should, you know, they're re really part of us. And uh, when that song ends, she is going to jump up and applaud and get everyone to stand up and do a standing ovation. And of course, you will react that way. She hopes you will. And President and Mrs. Nixon will stand up and they'll give a round of applause to this idea of Taiwan not being independent. So he, so I, for Secret Service, and I said, you sit here. And I, so I sat directly behind the president and, Mrs., uh, and uh, said, okay, I'm going to tell you when that, you know, they're going to pull this caper. So when it happened, I just said, okay, the fifth song, I'm pretty sure this is the one. Sure enough, she jumped up and Nixon just sat, sat there and stared. So she kept looking down. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't like getting caught that way. So. And then you went back in 79 when uh, Chairman Mao had died. Chairman Mao had died and there was then uh, uh, Hua. Uh, the, the new prime minister was Hua Kofeng. And first, President Nixon is going to go into, you know, substantive meetings. And President Nixon wanted, former President Nixon, uh, was intent that he was going to make an evaluation and send it back to the White House and say, you know, here's, <clears throat> here's what's going on. And so he said, as, is, as, I, as always, I went into the negotiations alone. And I said to him, you know, I'm not so sure it's a good idea that you go alone. 
uh, I can go in and just take notes because you may say something brilliant and no one will ever know. You may do something, you know, that, and I can check their reaction. So from then on, I dug myself a hole because from then on I had to go to all the meetings, which were very boring. And being me, I wanted to argue with them all the time. <laughs> and they, so, uh, anyway, do you any shorts? Well, thank you very much. Sure. Three, three sure. visits, Anytime. three, uh, three incredible pieces of history, moments of three history. Three incredible thank trips you. for me. Yep. And uh, thank you.